Yeah, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And today we're talking about, we're taking a look at Honolulu City Council Bill 80, which is really remarkable. Hi, Tom. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So, you know, the city council, uh, you know, has a, has a certain clout. Uh, sometimes it goes, it veers off course a little bit. Um, Bill 80 is probably a good example of that. Um, it has to do with, um, gee whiz, what? Hotels, I suppose, and tourism. Can you talk about the provisions in Bill 80, which is pending in the city council right now? Sure, as, as you know, um, here in the city and county of Honolulu, people are out of work uh, for the most part, especially in the hospitality industry. Um, but uh, uh, what, what Bill 80 says is really kind of remarkable. Uh, one of its first provisions says, and I quote, a hotel employee shall recall to active employment the same number of employees in substantially the same classifications as the hotel employer's active workforce on March 1, 2020, adjusted by the ratio of the occupancy of the, that the hotel bears to 100%. So if 50% occupancy, you gotta bring back 50% of your workers, at least. A hotel employer must clean and sanitize every occupied guest room every day and must employ a number of housekeeping employees to ensure that this standard is met. So whether or not you're uh, bringing on 50% of your uh, people because of 50% of uh, occupancy, uh, you need to have enough employees to clean every occupied guest room every day. Well, that's pretty interesting. Where exactly do they get off? Well, um, and and that's that's I think the uh, you know the, the hundred hundred thousand dollar question here, you know, does government have power to in fact do this? Uh, what the, what the bill says, uh, it, obviously they're assuming they, they do have enough power, and that the uh, the way that it would be enforced. Uh, is by private individuals who uh, haven't been recalled can sue, and if uh, and if they win, uh, they get uh, to have the hotel pay their attorneys' fees. So um, uh, it's li encouraging litigation, um, kind of putting a blunt instrument over the head of the uh, of the hotel employer, and and it's this is being pushed very very hard. Uh, by the uh, uh, by, the hotel employees union, uh, local five. Okay. Oh, so that's where it's coming from. But you know, this goes to the whole question of legislators, not only in the city council but in the state legislature, introducing bills that are absolutely useless and badly drafted, and you know, not likely to do anything for anybody. Well, we can cover that in substance. But let's assume for a moment this bill has no redeeming qualities. How in the world did it get to be pending in the city council? Who introduced it? What kind of process have we got that this kind of thing could waste our time? Well, uh, uh, apparently the uh, the union folks came to the people uh, in the relevant council district, which is uh, which is Tommy Waters district. Uh, he introduced the bill by request, which is what 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 people do if if uh, constituents come to you and say, "I want this introduced." So he's not saying he agrees with it. He just did it because he, a constituent requested that he do it. That's absolutely right. You know, uh, that happens in our state legislature as well. Uh, happens all the time. Uh, matter of fact, all of the government introduced bills are introduced by request. Uh, they come at the governor's request and uh, you know, the, 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 spe the, the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate introduce those bills by request. So it, is, it doesn't mean they agree with them but they have been requested to do so by, in this case, the governor. Other, other kinds of groups, uh, profit, nonprofit, uh, government, and, and so forth, uh, they, they come to the legislature or to the city council, as the case may be, and they request that, introduce, uh, that bills be introduced. And that happens all the time. Uh, so it's deeply ingrained. Is it, but is it deeply ingrained in other states as well, other cities? or? Do we have a special vulnerability to this kind of request? No, I don't think I don't think uh, that part is 
uh, atypical at all. But um, I, I think, you know, the thing that is atypical is, you know, we have a bargaining table, okay? Uh, you know, there's labor, there's management, and they're, and they're supposed to bargain over their working, you know, terms and working conditions. Okay. Um, it seems like, you know, this is a case where, uh, where the labor side is taking another crack at this um, in, instead of, or perhaps in addition to uh, trying to negotiate with management, and they're going to the government and saying, you know, government, please get involved, mandate this. Um, uh, yeah, I understand completely. And, <clears throat> you know, Local 5 have been, has been on ThinkTech several times in COVID in, in these difficult times. And the message pretty much has been the same each time. But they go to the hotel seeking some kind of relief, some kind of cooperation, collaborations, you know, joint, you know, addressing these problems that have come out of COVID and the hotels turn their backs on them. Um, and it, it's been consistent throughout COVID and they can't get the first base. And they're very frustrated because their, their members are in deep financial trouble and they, you know, don't have a bottomless pit of money. I'm not sure they have anything left to help their members out. So they're, they're in duress. So I can understand their frustration and, and if not desperation about going to the legislature for, uh, or rather the city council for some kind of, what, what bothers me though, is this bill, you know, okay. as you say, it may be a negotiating tactic, uh, you know, to get the attention of the hotels, so to speak. But gee whiz, uh, I mean, I don't think the legislature is an appropriate place for that, do you? Um, if you were, uh, if you were uh, Tommy Waters and somebody came to you with a bill like this, it's really special, um, and we'll go into that. But would you would you introduce that bill on request? I, I tell you, I wouldn't. I would say you'll have to find someone else. I'm not going to introduce that bill. Sorry. What would you say? Um, you know, uh, if if the bill looked like it had at least a little bit of merit, I would I would probably grit my teeth and introduce it. But uh, but I, I tell them, look, you know, I'm, I'm not promising to support it. Uh, but you know, you're you're my constituent. Uh, well, on that point, would you go back to them and say, look, look, guys, I understand your, your frustration <clears throat> and I want to help you, but this bill isn't going to help you. Uh, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that. Um, so let me make some suggestions for you about how you could make this bill work. Uh, wouldn't that yeah. be a better approach? Yeah, I, I think so, except that I'd lose the next election. And then <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but so what? You know, we have too many career politicians who run for office their whole lives. And they, you know, sorry, but they do not learn from term to term. Um, okay, anyway, so let's, let's talk about the, you know, the efficacy of the bill itself. This bill sounds like it's aspirational. It's like wishful thinking. It's like asking God to come down from heaven uh, and, make, and make my adversary, um, you know, uh, do whatever I dream and hope of. These things are uh, undoable and unenforceable, aren't they? Well, um, that's that's I think a very good question. Now, uh, and let me let me kind of tell you the the, the status of, of where this bill is, uh, because that is I think um, uh, very much in line with the question that you just asked, and, and that is, um, as of I think a couple of days ago, it was reported uh, that the uh, the, you know, the acting council chair had some misgivings about the bill because uh, the city attorneys had come to her uh, and said, you know, we've got concerns. Okay, so uh, although the bill was scheduled to be heard uh, by the full council, and the, the normal date would be today, okay, it, w it was taken off today's calendar, and and, set, and the uh, and the council chair said, well, okay, well, we're going to be uh, holding this for a little while. Uh, until we look at the legalities. And in the meantime, let's look at this resolution uh, that, you know, may, uh, you know, help with, you know, the same, the, you know, the same exact problem. And, and they're going to be talking about the resolution. Okay. But the bill isn't dead. Okay. And, and in a, a, a Star Advertiser article a couple of days ago, uh, one of the council members made it very clear that, uh, uh, that if negotiations broke down, he would uh, do his utmost to introduce, uh, to, 
uh, to get the bill back on track uh, later on this month. If it passes as a resolution, I mean, that'll take the steam out of the bill, won't it? I mean, <clears throat> whether course, there's yeah. lobbying or political pressure behind it or not, that it, it'll sort of diffuse the situation, won't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's and, that's kind of, I think that the path that, uh, uh, you know, people are going down, uh, the, uh, you know, the hotel industry is very, very, is very much against the bill. Um, and they, they welcome the chance to have it kind of sidetracked into a resolution. Uh, the union is very unhappy, uh, but um, uh, you know who, who knows what they're gonna do, but they, they came up with some very strong rhetoric uh, saying, you guys are, are, are with the hotel bosses or are you with us? You know, take your, take your choice. Gee, there's so many things flow out of this, but a digressionary point, and this does have to do with tax. For several years, um, Bill has been batting around the legislature that would impose uh, state income tax on, on REIT income in Hawaii. And I, what was the disposition of that most recently? Did it pass? Did it ever pass? Or um, it, was, it was an attempt for years and it never passed, but did it ever pass? Well, it, it passed, uh, I think, a couple of years ago and it got vetoed. Okay. Hmm. A lot of politics uh, the, involved. Yeah, um, it was reintroduced this uh, in the 2020 session, uh, but but then COVID hit and then pretty much nothing passed. Yeah, yeah. And and, and the read bill was one of them. Well, it goes to the question of this, Tom. I mean, the union and, and others in this community feel that the hotels, especially the international hotels, which although maybe they're not functioning so well here, are still functioning in other places and are bottomless pits of investor money. Um, they, they, they may not have bellied up to an obligation, sort of a moral obligation they have to Hawaii. What happens is they offer these, uh, what do we call union jobs, which are in large part, you know, service jobs in the hotels. Um, and and um, that's what their contribute, and they pay the TAT and real property tax, which I think they argue about a lot. Bottom line is um, people question, I think legitimately, whether they're paying their freight to the community. They, they resist the, uh, the, the, REIT, the REIT tax. Um, and um, uh, although they, you know, they do some things through the Hotel uh, Tourism Lodging Association, I, there are people who question whether they do enough to pay back, if you will, to the community so that you have a lot of people in this community don't like them much because they think they spirit away all the profit and are not invested in Hawaii. What do you think? Well, I mean, that's why you have, that's why you have unions. Uh, unions are supposed to be a, a more organized, large, large employers and unions are there to bargain and um, to, to kind of, you know, equalize the, the bargaining power of, you know, hotel on the one hand and uh, you know, the, the workers on the other. Now, and, and that, that I think is um, at least one of the key reasons why I think uh, that this legislation is questionable. And, and, and the reason is uh, we have federal labor laws in place uh, that are supposed to be kind of the exclusive means uh, that labor and management are supposed to deal with, it, with each other. It's called the National Labor Relations Act. And, and, uh, and one thing that the act uh, does uh, is it basically displaces any state, local, or any other laws that would get in the way of the balance that the National Labor Relations Act is trying to construct. It's called preemption. Uh, preemption is a legal term, but the effect is uh, that you know state laws or local laws that get in the way uh, are, are are basically invalid. Okay, do we have this kind of situation? Um, quite possibly, because uh, really what we've got going on is. Uh, issues which I think should be bargained between uh, the union and management. Um, and I don't think either side is entitled to go to government and get a third bite at the apple uh, or a second bite at the apple. But that's, what's, that, that's what happens. That's what appears to be happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where uh, legislators are vulnerable to unions knocking on their door and asking them for extraordinary relief. I mean, we we have very powerful unions in the state, and that's been the case a long time. But my, and my, my question is, uh, gee whiz, uh, 
if, if uh, it, it sounds very mm, sounds very workable, very appropriate um, to have this resolved as a as a, 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 a you know labor bargaining issue under the uh, National Labor Relations Association uh, uh, Act or otherwise. Um, and and uh, if the hotels turn their backs on the unions and won't talk to them, won't give them even the time of day, won't um, you know sympathize with them in the slightest way. Uh, what, what, what can the union do? Does the National Labor Relations Act force negotiation? Does it force them to negotiate with the union? Or is this COVID time so special that the uh, National Labor Relations Act doesn't help? Well, um, what, uh, what's supposed to happen in the, in the labor management situation is that uh, labor and management is supposed to bargain in good faith. Uh, there is a a duty under the law uh, for both sides to bargain in good faith. And uh, if they can't get to a resolution, then management can lock out or the union can strike. And that's uh, pretty much how things are, tr are traditionally resolved. Yeah, except that you, they got, you got to start. There's a duty of good faith bargaining. You have to open the door and sit at the table and uh, at least have a conversation. I don't think that's happened here. Okay, well, that's... That's, I think, something um, that the uh, you know the uh, NLRB or you know wh whichever federal agency, or even even the state la labor relations agency, can help with. Um, th the state also has uh, labor laws in addition to the federal labor laws, and uh, and, and those can be uh, you know called upon to help. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, at least. The, have the two sides listen to each other. Well, okay, so I, I put you at the table, Tom. I mean, it's a, this is a very difficult situation because we have COVID and these hotels are losing, at least arguably, I, who knows for sure, but they're losing tons of money. And, and the international ones arguably are also losing tons of money. They can make an argument to that effect because tourism is down worldwide. Um, and uh, whether they have money in the bank or not, it's not the question. But you know, currently they're losing money. The union guys are in dire straits. Um, how do you resolve this problem? Uh, and, and of course, Congress uh, is um, ineffectual. Uh, there's you know, there's no cares too. Although McConnell said yesterday, uh, after he won in in Kentucky, became magnanimous and said he felt there was going to be a cares too coming soon. But you know, who, who's to say? We're going to be tied up in the in the post-election process for a while. That that's what the big distraction is going to be, and it's not going to be cares too. Um, so, assuming all of that, you have arguably dire straits on both sides of the equation. What kind of bill? What kind of negotiation? What kind of result can possibly solve the problems that are raised in this Bill 80? Well, you know uh, what what Bill 80 doesn't do, and what labor and management negotiations can't do is create money out of nowhere. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, um, if there are going to be uh, funds to support uh, unionized labor, they got to come from somewhere. Um, and, you know, the, the employers can certainly, uh, you know, lay bare their books and their bank accounts and, and say, hey, look, guys, there's nothing here. Uh, you know, tourism in Hawaii has taken a hit by over 90%. Um, what do you expect? Uh, and then the answer will probably come back is, you know, we expect you to, uh, you know, take care of our people because because our people have taken care of you. And then, you know, the, 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 the discussion will go back and forth. That's like, it's like a, it's a moral question, but you, as you said, and I think it's really the takeaway from all of this is you can't create the money. Um, and to solve this problem, money has to come from somewhere. And, and I, would, I would add that you're talking about a principle that, that is, exists starkly here in Hawaii, but to some degree everywhere in the country, maybe you could say everywhere in the world, um, that, that there are dire things happening because of COVID. Uh, the economies of so many places are folding up getting worse all the time, unemployment and what have you. 
Um, yeah. Now, and, one and, very and interesting thing about the money. Bill 80, one very interesting thing about Bill 80, even if you look at it, is the enforcement uh, doesn't fall upon government. And we, we talked about that. The government, uh, uh, government's just kind of going to sit aside and, and let the private parties go file lawsuits and enforce this uh, by themselves. So uh, not even Bill 80 is saying that, uh, you know, government has resources to put into this thing, which would, which would ordinarily happen, right? I mean, you, you, you enact laws, uh, somebody violates laws, and somebody from, uh, from government in law enforcement you know, taps you on the shoulder and says, well, you got to comply with this law. That's, that's not how this ordinance or this potential ordinance is constructed. It's, it's very strange, but I think it's, you know, part of the recognition that there's no money anywhere. Yeah, a, a point on that, by the way, is, uh, so you have this vague, if not unenforceably vague law, if it's ever passed, okay? And then you have um, the bar, the, the plaintiff's bar would go after the hotels and say, you didn't, you didn't perform under the law. And, um, and then of course, um, the, uh, the, somebody in that case would ask for a jury trial on whether um, anybody performed. The judge would have a terrible time with instructions because the law is so vague. But assuming it got to the jury, then, then a local jury would probably favor the union and go after the hotels. That's terrifying that you could put this in front of a jury um, on, on whether damages or, my God, injunctive relief. No, that, no, the injunctive relief would be the judge only. Um, but what I'm saying is uh, this would be a mess in court. And uh, I, I think a lot of lawyers would take these cases because they may not have other work and they may want to ride in on the wave of uh, antipathy to the hotel industry. And so you have it's an enforcement technique that's kind of clever, but it's, it does violence. What do you think? You know, it's very scary. And, and I think you're correct. That's, that's how the bill was designed. So that yeah. you would have, um, you know, private lawyers uh, going in front of, uh, you know, local juries who may uh, be, you know, sympathetic to the, to the local people who are getting, uh, getting decimated, yeah. even though the hotel is getting decimated too. Yeah, so uh, just to go back to the, the global point here, um, your, your, your basic rule there, your black letter rule is you can't create money. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the problem is that our economy is deflating. It's, 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 it's dissolving. Uh, COVID is going to go on for a long time, probably a year. The spikes are extraordinary. There was a chart in this morning's time showing how many people catch it in a given day. 109,000 people in, uh, get the disease every day in this country. 109,000 people every day. It's really going crazy. And ultimately, you know, thousands are dying and will continue to die. And by the end of the year, we'll have some extraordinary figures. And even if you want to, you know, uh, ignore it for a while, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to you or somebody close to you very soon. And so, the, you know, the, um, the, the terror aspect of that is, is going to be huge, even if it's not now. And the economy is going to be affected. And the economy is, is, is going to take a big hit for a long time. And we're not going to have as good an economy. Our quality of life, all of us, will be affected. This country is on the, on the decline right now. For, aside from all the other issues that Trump has, has generated, you know, the economy is huge. And, and what does that mean? It's, it's that, you know, the, the, uh, in this case, the local five, uh, suffering, there'll be a lot of other suffering going on, economic suffering going on. And we're all going to have to get used to the fact that we, we don't have the economy we had and we can't get back to it. This is going yeah. to affect everything, don't you think? 
Yeah, no, I think in, in addition to um, uh, the fundamental truth that, uh, you know, we're not creating money, uh, the other fundamental truth is that there's plenty of pain to go around. Yeah. And I think well, we all have to realize country, that. But in the world. Well, here especially. Yeah. As, you know, in the hospitality industry, it's been particularly acute. Yeah. So what's going to happen? I mean, it, it seems to me that this is only one one shot across the bow sort of thing. So we have this bill uh, 80, but there'll be other things too. I mean, when people are desperate, they do other things too. Uh, can we expect this in the legislature in January? Well, I, I, I think um, what we have here is I think more symptomatic of the problem that we're a one, uh, we're, we're a one horse economy. We got tourism and that's pretty much it. Um, and that's why we're cre that that's why we have I think so much more pain uh, in the hotel industry and that that it affects you know many many more people than it, it would anywhere else. So uh, I I hope uh, that when our new legislature gets back in session gets back to work, uh, they they really take some serious steps to uh, you know help diversify our economy. Uh, so. Uh, it would at least blunt the pain that, uh, you know, that happens when, uh, when, when tourism gets hit hard, like, like it has here. Well, you know, lately we've been having a, a, a fair amount of interest on think tech about an issue that was in, you know, regular and hot discussion back in the early years of the century um, about diversification of the economy. And there were a lot of people, uh, you, know, you know, the young people in tech and entrepreneurship, a growing body, uh, uh, composed of people who'd been in Silicon Valley in the 90s and maybe made some money or at least got excited about things and came back and tried to make a go of it here. It didn't work. And Act 221 was bashed by Linda Lingle and, and that went away. And we don't have, we only have radioactivity about that. We don't have a significant fund we don't have significant incentives. Um, even the Manoa Innovation Center has been turned, turned over from uh, the Hawaii uh, Development uh, Corporation, High Tech Development Corporation to the university where it is now a sort of a mixed bag. Um, there's not a lot of focus on diversification uh, and diversification to technology. And furthermore, and if you have ideas about this, the world is, is waiting for you, Tom. How do you do incentivization with, without spending any money. If we have no money to spend, how are we going to incentivize diversification and thus alleviate the pain of having a mono economy in tourism that doesn't work? Well, um, I think we can, we can ask ourselves uh, how much interference uh, that, that our, our government is currently exerting in, uh, in, in the industry, like with uh, employee mandates, payroll taxes, uh, things like that, uh, maybe lessening those burdens would be a means of giving incentives to work. Well, you, but don't incentives always cost money? I mean, if you say, uh, we're gonna give you a tax holiday, we're gonna give you tax credit. Um, those are you know customary incentives and a lot of states and communities have, have built tech industries by doing that, and movie industries, I should add. Um, but if this it still costs money, it comes out of the till. Um, uh, is the legislature going to be willing to do that? They have not been for 20 years. Uh, and, and furthermore, you know, the only way to do it is to have a champion in there who will uh, advocate for tech and, and the arts, I guess. If I were in the legislature or you, uh, I, might, I might be, uh, you know, supportive of that. But I'm not sure there's anybody that comes to mind who is. Right. I mean, you know, having no money is a pervasive problem and there really isn't uh, a whole lot can be done. Yeah. So from a fiscal policy point of view, assuming, you know, there are a lot of people talking the talk about how we have to reconsider diversification, which John Burns talked about and every governor has talked about but it has never worked. The closest came it was Act 221 under Ben Caetano. But, but since then, you know, it's been clear that this, this is not what Hawaii wants to do. And, and there are people like me, like others at ThinkTech, 
you know, who've been calling for uh, diversification, the natural object of that is technology uh, without success for years and years. So <clears throat> the question is, this is my ghost of Christmas future question. We, aren't, we do not have the political will, even in crisis, to diversify. Um, and at the same time, we're not going to be able to reopen the economy. It's going to get worse. There was a thing in, where was it, the civil beat this morning. Um, or maybe, no, the advertiser this morning about how we're not, we're probably not going to get to phase three reopening because of the increases in cases. So with all of that, um, um, the economy is going to be in worse and worse shape. What can the legislature do? Very good question. We're going to be, I think, seeing uh, a lot of the discussions that take place once the legislature uh, starts up and then uh, we can, uh, you know, once that happens, we can have some more uh, discussion and see what is actually happening. What about a tax increase? What about a rock'em sock'em real property tax increase? What about a tax increase on the, on the gross excise? What about an income tax increase? Are those things in, in the wings, assuming the government simply doesn't have enough money to operate and it must operate and the federal government isn't doing anything? Isn't that in the wings? I'm sure all of those proposals will be in play. So there'll be discussions. We just have to keep vigilant and, uh, you know, keep everybody informed about what's going on. And, and if, you know, if, if you don't think that's the right direction to go in, uh, you need to uh, make your voice heard, talk to your legislator, um, make sure that uh, you know, the people that are uh, in, the, in the seats of power uh, have your interest in heart. Okay, it's time to have smart policy here. We, we can do it with smart policy. And you and I will have to cover it going forward because it will, it will have to be nuanced. and It'll have to look around the corner, look into the future. Yep. Thank you, Tom. Tom Yamachika, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. It's not an easy question, but Tom can always answer. Thank you so much, Tom. <laughs> Thanks for your confidence, Jane. Thank you for letting me be on the show.